Okay, this is EE uh, 2070, week 5, lecture 3, Dr. Muthuswami recording. Today we're going to talk about RLC, that is second, but actually higher order linear circuits. I've already written up the basic idea, and the idea is that the analysis of an RLC circuit is no different from the procedures that we used in chapter 7 for first order RL and RC circuits, because these three I concepts do not change. It is capacitors or inductors maintain voltage or current across discontinuities respectively. And at steady state, capacitors or act like open circuits, inductor act like short circuits. And the total response, since we are dealing with linear dynamic systems, is always the sum of the steady state and transient response. But now, uh, since we have Let's see, uh, I'm just checking some for background, background noise. Okay, great. Anyway, since we have constant input functions, number one, the steady state response is easy to compute uh, because at steady state capacitors and inductors, we know how they behave. And also, the transient response is will still be complex exponential functions. You will see that the special case of uh, no dampening can lead to steady state sinusoidal responses. But anyway, speaking about sinusoidal responses, we will see that for second and higher order circuits, we can now have the possibility of damped harmonic oscillations because our exponential functions can be complex exponential functions. That's about it for actually second and higher order linear circuits. And the best way to understand this is through an example. So let me go through this practice problem. Okay. Uh, so, and this is basically a series RLC circuit in the sense for, so here's a solution for t greater than or equal to zero, the circuit looks something like this. Actually, the circuit looks exactly like this. So let me, as usual, put in the numbers later. Let's just use symbols. So here you have B, no B, so oops, I'm going to go into numbers, which I don't want currently. R, and obviously, when the switch has been in a steady state at t equals 0 minus, that is, if the switch has been in this position for a long time, the current, the inductor acts like a um, short circuit. So the current through the inductor, well, that's what we want. That's what he's asking us to find, I of t. But then I of 0 minus is equal to I of 0 plus is equal to 10 amps because current and the inductor maintains current through it across discontinuities. But now to solve the circuit, let's write uh, the KVL expression that describes the single loop LCR circuit. We are not using KCL, obviously, because the KCL, KCL expression is trivial. So KVL says VL, uh, let's see plus VR plus VC equals zero. Understand that all of these are functions of time. I'm not going to explicitly write that because it's implied. Now, we want to solve for the current I in the loop and through each element. So we just have to eliminate all these voltages in terms of current. So let me, for one equation, write the time, make the time explicit. That is VC of T equals zero. So I used Ohm's law in accordance with the passive sign convention because of the way I assign this voltage drop uh, judiciously. So the current flows through the positive direction of voltage drop that I assigned. And then if you keep going, so this implies V, uh, VL, the voltage across the inductor is L di dt plus this is IR plus VC equals zero. And then now if I differentiate both sides with respect to time, I get L d squared i dt squared plus R di dt plus dvc dt is zero. But now I can even eliminate dvc dt uh, by using the IV relationship across the capacitor or associated with the capacitor. So I get L d squared i dt squared plus R di dt plus the voltage across the rate of change of voltage across the capacitor is given by I over C equals zero. So now I have a, uh, let's write it out. Uh, let's make the leading coefficient of the uh, let's make the leading coefficient unity. So I basically have, using our dot notation, I double dot plus R over L I dot 
plus i over lc equals 0, i of 0 plus we know is 10 amps. Now we need a second initial condition that we'll find shortly. We need to find this. So we'll do that. But basically, here is our um, system equation. Note the units. And then let me write this in red. In the sense, uh, we should always do a dimension check. So a couple of points, right? So understand in what context this appears. Note number one, uh, dimensions of d squared i over dt squared is amps, it's the di dt is the rate of change of current, so it's amps per second. Rate of change of amps per second is amps per second squared. Uh, the units of R over L di dt is units one over L over R di dt. So this is also amps per second squared in the sense you should recognize that L over R is the time constant from chapter seven, okay? And then finally, same thing, that is uh, I over LC should be also amps per second squared. The units is consistent, but also notice that uh, recall from our frequency response description of RLC circuits, we have the bandwidth R over L and omega naught, which is the natural frequency of oscillation, one over square root of LC, uh, both occur in uh, equation one, okay? So in other words, what we are doing is, what we are, I mean, the circuit we're solving is nothing new. We have already seen this before, so it is no surprise, or it should be a no surprise to you that these parameters occur again, right? And as usual, there, my journal is saved, that's awesome. Okay, so in order to solve, now let's solve equation one, in order to solve Looks like my thing's gonna crash, so I'm gonna save this again and restart it. And I have the uh, problem open from my uh, from my Connect website associated with the, when I offered EE 2060. So anyway, we can check our answer. In order to solve one, let us assume the solution is an exponential okay so this is how do we know this based on our experience as our previous knowledge with first order circuits a e to the st Okay, uh, therefore, equation one will imply the second derivative of this guy is A times, the, well, derivative of E to the ST twice is S squared E to the ST, plus don't forget, obviously, the constants R over L, S E to the ST, and there's an A floating around here, plus A E to the ST over LC equals zero. But now you should recognize what I'm doing if you have taken, I mean, you should have taken a differential equations course. So this is the characteristic polynomial associated with our differential equation. Therefore, the solution implies, therefore, a characteristic polynomial associated with one, and that is S squared plus R over LS plus one over LC. Therefore, hence what we have is obviously if this is has to be zero, there's no way this can be zero. So as, as t goes to infinity, assuming S is negative, that's the only way this function can be zero. A cannot be zero because the, the initial condition is zero. It doesn't do 
anything uh, of interest in our system. So here is our characteristic polynomial being equal to zero. Therefore, the two roots, and this it works out beautifully, minus b plus or minus sort of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, it works out beautifully in the sense you should recognize this when we simplify this as the half power frequencies from our discussion of resonance circuits. So you factor out 4 to the appropriate simplifications. So let me write this in red. Recall this, these, or these are the half power frequencies. Frequencies from resonance ideas. Okay. So again, there is, all of this should not surprise you because we have already uh, seen this before, but then uh, just to uh, clarify some terminology, so going through your book here, so what I want to clarify is the fact that we have this definition of alpha, okay, or the damping factor, an omega naught, which we already know, so let's use that, the sense is minus alpha plus or minus square root of alpha squared minus omega naught squared. So alpha is the damping factor, okay? Omega naught is the natural frequency. And you will see why this is called damping factor. You all should already know why omega naught is called, actually, we'll see why also omega naught is called the natural frequency, right? So this is, I'm gonna write this slightly differently. As, actually, I'll do that later, right? So now, basically, we now have three possibilities uh, for the solution. Okay. So case one is S1 and S2 are real. S1 is not equal to zero, real and unequal roots. We'll obviously have our I of T as A1 e to the S1T plus A2 e to the S2T. A1 and A2 are found from I of 0 and I dot of 0, obviously, okay, from your differential equations class. Number 2, S1 is equal to S2 and their real numbers. Then I of T is going to be a1 e to the st. Obviously, I cannot write a2 e to the st, so I'll add a t there, e to the st, okay? So this is called the uh, overdamped case, okay? So this is overdamped, okay? This is critically damped. And the most interesting case, in my opinion, is when S1, 2 are complex numbers, okay, they always, they'll always occur, uh, so in this case, therefore, alpha squared is less than omega naught squared. This implies, let, let's write our solution like this, in the sense, now what I can do, I can write this as, square root of negative 1 is j, and then let me put an omega d here, where, omega d is defined as square root of omega naught squared minus alpha squared. This is called the damped uh, frequency of oscillation, all right? So it's uh, obviously when alpha is zero, omega d is equal to omega naught, right? That's why this is called the natural frequency. This is called the damped frequency of oscillation. But basically, our solution now, with the third case, i of t is going to be a1 e to the minus alpha plus omega d j t plus a2 e to the negative alpha minus omega d j times t 
in other words if we keep simplifying this and i don't want to do this because the lecture is only uh 20 minutes long and i have only five more minutes so let me just write it out though e to the uh so here basically you have e to the minus alpha t a1 e to the minus omega d j times t okay let me write it like this plus e2 e to the minus uh, okay let me put the plus here it doesn't matter the plus here and the minus here where i put the plus and minus okay so basically you have this is harmonic uh, solution and here is the uh, damping okay so you have damped harmonic solutions okay and in your book so and i recommend you do this uh, please prove this and it's actually done in your book so let me show that to you so blah 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 and you can see all the plots okay but here it is okay so he actually does a derivation using euler's formula so what you basically get is it's e to the minus alpha t b1 cosine omega dt plus b2 sine omega dt and the key is you need to use euler's formula or you did the j theta which takes a complex number in exponential form and converts it to a complex number in standard form okay so here is Euler's formula. Okay, so you need to know this. Let me just box this. Okay. But in, in essence, going back to our problem, what it involves now is figuring out what kind of um, solution that we have. So basically, let me solve the problem. So going back to practice problem 8.4 we need to understand what kind of solution by kind I mean over damped critically damped under damped that we have and use the approach expressions appropriate expressions okay for the solution note that for higher order systems although we can easily find the initial condition we can also find the total response using something called as a Laplace transform and uh, we'll do that that's the final part of this course and we'll do that next after our next after exam two but for now, I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the lecture, solve the problem, and then explain the solution for a minute so I can uh, restrict the lecture video length. All right, I'll be back. Okay, continuing. Uh, that did take a little bit of time to solve in the sense it took more than a minute and a half. Okay, I mean, it took me like two minutes, but whatever. So basically, going back to the circuit, we already found that the initial condition is 10 amps. Okay, so here are all the numbers. We need to find the rate of change of current through the inductor first. And it's easy because the rate of change of current through the inductor is given by the voltage across the inductor divided by the inductance. Now KVL implies, which you already used, is VL is minus VC minus VR. But if you recall, when the switch was at this position, the cap is initially discharged. So when you move the switch over here, the cap initially still has zero volts, okay, minus VR. But then VR is simply I times R. So basically, you get I dot of the rate of change of current through the inductor as negative 50 amps per second. So if you compute your alphas and your omegas, we'll see we have the underdamped case. So if you just plug it in, we need to simply find constants B1 and B2. So if you plug in T equals 0, the B2 term drops off. So B1 is simply I of 0, which is 10 amps. Now to find B2, you simply take the derivative of this expression since we know what di dt is. So you take the derivative using the product rule, chain rule, uh, all the elementary calculus, 
and then plug in t equals zero, you can solve for B2 as approximately negative 15.08 amps. And uh, the final answer is obviously the unit is amps. And notice that I have this unit step function emphasizing that this response is valid for t greater than or equal to zero. And I told you in the couple, last couple of lectures, you should get used to writing the unit step function, not only because it is mathematically correct, but then also uh, we will definitely require it for the Laplace transform. So let's just confirm our final answer with the books or check if the book is correct, All right? So if you look at the final answer, you can see the book is indeed uh, correct, right? And if you want to sketch this, uh, which you should, right? The book uh, has a nice sketch. I don't have time to sketch this, but basically here it is. So you have an exponential envelope. This is going to be e to the negative 2.5 t in our case with a damped uh, harmonic oscillation of frequency 2 pi over omega d, where omega d is 1.658 radians per second. Okay, that's about it for this lecture. For the next couple of lectures, there are no, there are, no, there are not going to be any video recordings because we're just going to solve problems from the book. So I implore you to go through uh, your assigned reading, which is basically, um, hopefully I, don't, I haven't logged out. Okay, I've logged out. But if you go back, uh, it's, oh yeah, here are chapter eight section. So please go through your assigned reading, which is all of this. I have done this part. Okay, sorry, I've done this part. It, everything else is very is analogous. Right? Please do the reading uh, and start practicing prompts. All right, I'll see you next time.